Hey guys, Doug Charles here. Rich, I'm looking at my watch right now. It's time for Warriors. And wow, man. It is. What's up, Doug? You fresh? How are you, man? Hey man, I'm looking at a uh, good, good, good. Uh, I'm looking at some emails uh, from the Warriors and Wildmen subscribers that Zeke shot over uh, this morning. And uh, Larry Knight uh, talking about our podcast E85Y, Men Avoid Church. He said, this is an excellent video. Doug and Rich, I'm grateful to God for the work that you both do. I will be praying for both of you. Rich, is that not a relief? What do, what do you and I hear most of the time? You suck. Yep. You're the devil. <laughs> We pray that, uh, you know, uh, your kids die and, and you burn in eternal uh, flames. Yeah, like uh, the people, they love to comment on our stuff and, and we, don't get, we don't get to see as many of these positive comments because uh, they don't pop up on the radar. Unfortunately, the negative stuff gets most of the attention, you know, but these are some pretty cool um, comments we've been getting from you guys. So when you guys send this stuff, um, we, we do get it and we read it. And that's why we want to talk about it a little bit on here and give you guys a little shout out. Steve Clausen on uh, talking about millennial Christians. He said, the reason millennials believe they should not share their faith with people of other religions is that they most likely do not believe in hell. Rob Bell stated that he, uh, hell was created by the Puritans in the 17th century. This is becoming a popular view. Thanks for calling right. them out. You guys rock. Keep calling truth, truth, and keep calling out the lies. You know what I mean? And so that's, hey, uh, theology is a big deal. I know to me and you, Doug, and, and if, we're, if our podcast was called Theology, you know, we'd probably get the wrong crowd. But, right. but theology is the base of what we talk about every time we talk. Yeah, I like it. Uh, when I was in a uh, uh, seminary at Knox Seminary up in uh, Coral Ridge down in Florida, <clears throat> rather, uh, Dr. Sproul said, uh, you know, those people who say, you know, I just I don't like theology. I just love Jesus. And uh, Sproul in his uh, classic caustic retort would say, um, <laughs> you can't love Jesus properly unless you do it uh, through good theology. That's and right. Christ by Christ, by the way, little tinker pot who doesn't like doctrine, you just like Hillsong music and, uh, and having your squishy feelings about Jesus. Uh, he is defined through the scripture. And um, Paul warned, I believe, uh, uh, Rich, there's a warning in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, I believe, that um, you could believe in a Jesus that doesn't exist. You That's could right. receive a spirit that ain't the Holy Spirit, and you, <laughs> and you could have swallowed a gospel that is not the gospel at all. And so, uh, yeah, mad props to Steve uh, uh, Clayson or Clausen, who pointed out uh, something of a theological astuteness about the existence of hell. You don't hear, listen, Christian, Rich, I know you do it in your church, man. Yeah, we always uh, say, hell, no, we won't go. Right. It's all, uh, about, the, it's all about the punctuation, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> uh, here's a test for the words and while I'm listener. When you go to church, and um, tell me how many times you hear the word hell mentioned or judgment mis mentioned or sin mentioned. I think we did a whole podcast on uh, 10 words that you don't hear in church anymore that the Bible is filled with, <laughs> yep. by the way. But uh, hey, uh, Larry, I got to I got to tell you, Larry, and thank you again, Steve, for uh, 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 pointing out uh, the millennials belief and why they don't share the faith. And uh, Rob Bell. ooh. Rich, I wouldn't want to be him when he goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jehovah at the Bema seat. And uh, also, I love the Puritans. I've got a bookshelf. I don't know if you can see it in the camera. No, you can't, but it's loaded with the works of the Puritans. But, Larry, let me let me tell you something, man. And, Steve, thank you for praying for us. Yeah. Uh, thank you for praying for warriors and wild men. We're here to put a big scar in Satan's crumbling kingdom. Our goal is to make masculinity great again. In, and uh, and to promote under Christ's governance, the provider, protector, hunter, and hero. Rich, that thing that is known as toxic masculinity. That's right. And you know what? Our goal is to be as toxic as it comes as long as uh, what they're referring to as toxic max masculinity is traditional ba masculinity based on the Bible. Uh, I want to read one more, Doug, before we, we get on the topic today. Listen to this. You're going to love this. Um, this is by Citizen Politician on uh, Reddit, and it was on Reddit. Uh, and this was on the, the podcast that we did. I think it was just a little clip we did on pro-choice Christians. And it says, why does this, Tom, referring to the video, why does this video only have 40 views? Man, this needs to get up there. Come on, people, do your best. Heck, I'm not really religious, but I might attend this church. Come on, somebody. Yeah. 
There it is, man. And Rich, uh, not that we're not out to, uh, you know, feed the sheep and, uh, you know, help the brothers and the sisters that are already in the fold. But, um, you know, hopefully the way uh, we look at Christianity, the way that we look at uh, God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the fact, Rich, that you and I are pieces of crap in and of ourselves that were rescued by a, a very gracious and loving God, we hope that this podcast uh, doesn't stay within the stained glass walls of the frozen chosen. We want it to break yeah, boundaries. That would be we the opposite to- of what we're trying to do, right? Yeah. Exactly, man. We wanted to go, like they said in what Star Trek, where no man has gone before. We want this message to go out there that just because you're a Christian, guys, doesn't mean you have to be a pussy. Yep. And uh, here's here's something else that I uh, that I don't know. You know, with the citizen politician in his comment over Reddit. Uh, it brings out a great point, guys. If you like Warriors and Wild Men, hello, man. Uh, share it. Put it on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook anymore, but if you're still there, link to it, man. Put it out there. There's a lot of people that we're serving some uh, some rarefied, yummy steak to that are starving to death. They need to supplement their spiritual uh, diet, their masculine diet. So shoot it over there to them. Come on, folks. Rich, what what should we do? Should we reward people? Say that um, they share it and they can prove uh, that they did to like 100 people. I'll give them the King David print. I'll print one of those things out. And these things are a beast. Either the King David or the Braveheart, or if you want Clint Eastwood or John Wayne, you can go over to DougGiles.art. If you can show me that you've distributed this, to a hundred different people, and I don't know how we quantify that. Zeke might have a, a better string to hold on that. Uh, but if, if they shared it, figure to, it out. he'll figure out the number too. I tell you what, let's go to five hundred because those are expensive. I mean, we're talking, Rich. We're talking about a thousand. Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on the size, a thousand to a twelve hundred dollar print. So you show me that that thing has been. Uh, distributed to 500 people you might as well get us. two ready right now because i'm gonna tell you that daniel crow and craig are gonna it's there yeah you you might as well print a couple of them up okay because i know two guys right. and and they're gonna be listening to this too i know two guys that so you might as well just start packaging them up just ask them which ones they want ahead of time because they are about it now it's not originals but uh prints but oh my gosh man rich you got you got the king david print beautiful but uh again man and uh Rich, I know I'm speaking for you, not that I have to, but thank you guys for yes. getting into it, uh, for digging what we're uh, selling. And um, also, not only if you uh, thank you for these reports, but if you want to sew into our war chest and you want to take your hard-earned drachmas and dump it into our war chest so that we can expand the vision of Warriors and Wild Men yeah. to make it even more zany and crazy, then knock yourself out, man. Rich, it's tax deductible. Am I correct? That's right. We can get you the information. We actually find that on the Warriors and Wild Men site. And, uh, you know, like Doug said, this is this is what we're selling, but we're not selling. This is what we're giving. And if you want to support yep. it and you believe in it, go there and, uh, you know, you get all the paperwork and get all your tax deductible stuff. And But you can sew into something and make it happen, you know, because this stuff doesn't happen for free. Uh, we do it because we love it and believe in it, but we want to reach more people and uh, you can make that happen. Yeah, and we believe it's going to happen. We're not worried about it, and uh, we want you to partner with us, man. We're partnered with uh, God and the Holy Spirit in this particular peculiar funk that he's called us to, and uh, we'd love for you to get on board and uh, help us financially. And we want to meet at conferences. We had the great one in Yuma last month. Yep. Uh, we're, we're thinking, man. We're, we're, um, we're conniving. We're trying Scheming. to figure out— scheming man where's the next one gonna be is it texas is it arizona is it at your church i don't know man but uh we want to bring the warriors and wild men experience to you guys speaking about the experience rich i got uh rudely interrupted last week during the podcast as you know by a fox that i let the air out of got i shot him and uh i killed him and um uh we didn't really finish the stuff about People getting in, you and I getting in, churches getting in, nations getting in to ruts. So let's pick it back up, man. Yeah, so one, in, of the, uh, one of the things we talked about on a rut, Doug, is the definition of a rut is is a coffin with the ends kicked out. You know, and and, and a rut is just death, man. There's, there's no life in it. It's just, you know, you get stuck in that, 
You, you know, it's like, I always tell people it's like when you're driving. Well, a lot of people haven't been driving in washes in Arizona, but in the desert, it's soft sand where the water runs when it runs when when it rains, right? So when you're driving a truck in there, and people have been driving in there, and it hasn't rained in a long time, there's these there are these ruts that go all through there, and in the sand they get pretty deep. Doug, you can literally in a four wheel drive truck, you can get in those ruts. Let go of the steering wheel. I'm not not like for a second. You can let go of the steering wheel and hit the gas and hang out and talk to your friends. You will follow that rut <laughs> miles, Doug, without touching the steering yeah. wheel. I'm not kidding. And so scary. So if that's taking you where you want to go, well, heck, man, that's awesome. But a lot of times, the ruts that we're in, they're not taking us where we're trying to go, and it takes some effort to get out of them. Uh, you brought up last uh, podcast we did on the ruts, how, how the rut is that which is comfortable, that which is uh, safe, that which is secure. Uh, but it's but it's um, and it might not be evil. I mean, the, the scripture that we bounced off of in Deuteronomy one, verse six through eight says God spoke to uh, Israel at Horeb saying, you've stayed long enough at this mountain, turn and set your journey and get into the land of the Canaanites. Uh, I want you I want you completely tackling the Arabah, the hill country, the low land, the Negev, the sea coast. Uh, the Canaanites, Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river, the river Euphrates. He said, I've placed this land before you. You need to go in and possess the land uh, which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to them and their descendants after them. Now, please note, uh, and forgive me for being redundant, but um, <clears throat> they weren't. Uh, he didn't say, all right, man, you've been doing cr crystal meth long enough. You've been dating pirate hookers long enough. <laughs> uh, he didn't say that. He said they're on a mountain. It's a beautiful mountain, isn't it, Rich? It's Birds beautiful. are chirping. Yeah, it's not. He didn't say and you're on the sinful hill of Rome or Babylon. No, he said you're 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 stuck on a mountain, and I've got other things for you to go in and to possess. And to me, that's the definition of the rut. I don't care what your rut is. It could be boring, lazy boy type rut. Rich. It could be. Look at me. I'm adventure Instagram model rut. If it's not what God has called you to do. And what he's commanded his church to do, then whatever you're doing that has crap all to do with what he wants done, I define that, Rich, is an R-U-T, baby, a rut. And uh, and listen, if you don't think that I'm I'm not applying this to my life, oh yeah, you're a cuckoo bird. I got my ruts, you got your ruts, and we need to get our butts out of these ruts. Rich, that's I think right. I just rhymed. Get your butts you out of the ruts. You know that's anointed. Here's a quote by A.W. A. Tozer on sharing the rot. <laughs> Listen to this. Um, the church is afflicted by dry rot. This is best explained when the, when the psych, psychology of non-expectation takes over and spiritual rigidity sets in, which is an inability. This is it right here, Doug. An inability to visualize anything better. A lack of desire for improvement. Come on, no. man. I, I couldn't think of a better definition. I'm going to say that again. It's uh, an inability to visualize anything better. A no. lack of desire for improvement. There are many who respond by arguing, I know lots of evangelical churches that would like to grow and do their best to get the crowds. Uh, they want to grow their churches and their, their Sunday. They want to have a contest to see who can grow their churches on Sunday. That's true. But they're trying to, ch dude, this is going to blow your mind. That's true, but they're trying to get people to come and share in their rut. They want people to come and celebrate uh. the rut and finally join in the rot. Because the Holy Spirit <laughs> yeah. is not given a chance to work in our services. Nobody's repenting. Boom! Why would I say it when Tozer said it? much more articulately, and he spells correctly, and uh, people like him. So there you go. Now that he's dead, not when he was alive, everybody hated his guts, but now that he's dead, he's a hero, right? Of course. Yeah. Uh, you know what we should do, Rich? We should write a book about praising him instead of uh, imitating him. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do, Doug? I don't give a rip. I hope when I'm dead, I hope when I'm dead, the descendants of the people who hate my guts quote me in their sermons. There you go, bro. <laughs> I like how um I like how Tozer uh, uh, defined right, uh, and again, you know, this is this is something that you might have success. Uh, you you might have some kind of measure of blessing. Yeah, not comparing uh, you, it to somebody else, right? It's not. Yeah, and and this and this is a thing. This is a thing that jacks to me uh, with with guys like you 
who who've obviously got a measure of kingdom success. God's blessed you incredibly for over the last 25 years. Yeah, there's been some uh, quicksand. There's been some <laughs> some hurdles that you face. Same thing with me. Here I am. At, uh, you just turned 50. I just turned uh, 56. And um, I still think I can get in a rut. I still think I can get myopic. I still think, uh, Rich, that I can get in my my little spiritual, comfortable, uh, lazy boy and just sit back on my laurels and just congratulate myself on what God has done yep. instead of, Lord, what are you saying now? Because I'm not dead yet. you got to be jacking with me in some way. Your mission on planet Earth's not completed. Uh, what do you got to say to Warriors and Wild Men? What do you got to say to Rich? What do you got to say to me? What kind of freaking glide path that I have that is mediocre that you want me to abort and get into some different level of a uh, uh, Holy Ghost stratosphere, Rich. Can you dig that? Doug, you just blew my mind up with something that that's I'm, I'm down with that. Listen to this. This, this is what you triggered in my little brain. You found something in there. So God's okay. The temple building the temple. Was that God's idea or man's idea? Man. The tabernacle. Was that God's idea or man's idea? God's. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't, read, I don't read, man. Check this out. I listen to Hillsong. <laughs> man's idea, well, let's do the same thing in the same place every day, all the time, so that we can build a system. And God's idea was, let's pack it up and be ready to move out when I say move. Stop when I say stop. Roll when I say roll. You know what I mean? God was like, I got you in the daytime. I got you in the nighttime. I'm going to be in the center of everything. You're going to watch everything that I do. You're going to follow me. I'm I'm with you as long as you're with me. And they said, you know what would be awesome? If we turn this into a religion. And, And I think, but that's not just with the Lord, but I think that's in our life. God has taken us on a journey because what's his goal? He led Abraham out. It said he was taking him to a city, right? And it says Abraham went out without knowing where he was going because where he was going wasn't a destination. It was a person. It was a journey. The destination was after this life. In this life, it should be a journey and moving and rolling and making it happen. And you know what we like to do? We like to build tents. We like to build churches. We like to build monuments. Bigger bigger barns, You know what they say, man, movement, method monument it's over and and we love to follow we love to take the things of god and turn them into something that's stale and 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 the same we turn it into a rut in our personal life well, i've i've been uh, rich i've been around uh, ministers uh uh was one i, I guess i still am you one are, to uh, some extent are. can't get away even though i don't it. have a yeah i don't have a formal uh uh church or anything I have uh but i am the high priest of clash madness and i and i share the, the warriors of wildman <laughs> and I share the Warriors and Wild Men Thunder uh, right. microphone with my buddy uh, Ricardo. That's right. Hey, um, uh, I don't even know where I was going with that. Oh, I, I, I know now. You know, what's interesting is, is watching uh, ministers hit, and you know a lot of these guys, and I'm not going to bring up any names because I just don't want to be, you know, uh, a that little guy. chick about any of that. Yeah. But you look at them, you see, you see them uh, hit a level of success, and then all of a sudden, I'll never forget this one pastor in particular. Then all of a sudden, uh, he doesn't pray anymore. He doesn't study anymore. He's uh, he's doling out sermons that he did 25 years ago. He's like a, a, a what is it, a doddering old fool. Yep. It's like, what happened to the fire that, uh, <laughs> that, that drew me to this ministry, to this message? It's just freaking gone. And you know what? Uh, two examples that come to my mind of uh, uh, two old mentors, two old curmudgeon prophetic people in the body of Christ that, uh, you know, Dr. Sproul obviously has passed away. Uh, him and Oz Guinness, who's 75 years old at uh, this recording, I believe, uh, those guys never stop learning, never stop building, always had something new going on, always ready to shake and rattle the devil's cage yep. and put a deep wound in his haggard backside. And I'm telling you what, man, I want me, I want you, I want the Warriors and Wildmen listener to be the frickin' 85-year-old Joshua and Caleb who, who spy the promised land and they don't whine and complain and say we're grasshoppers. They're like, shit, that's my mountain over there. You get that mountain, you help yep. me get mine, I'll help you get yours, and boom, off they go with a bunch of 20-somethings. That's what I pray happens to you, Rich, to me, to Zeke, and to the whole Warriors and Wildmen audience, is that we never 
no matter what our success level is, get satiated and self preening and self congratulatory, and then just decide or, we're going to sit and lavish into our luxury. Or the word that should never be mentioned comfortable. I'm comfortable and happy, which means I'm not trying to do anything. I like Caleb. Caleb's like, yeah, I'm 85. I'm just as strong to conquer as I was when I was 40. You know what? I picture, when I picture Caleb, you know how I picture Caleb, Doug? I don't picture him as some like uh, fencing swordsman. I, yeah. I, I picture him being short, square, humongous beard, kind of ugly with a big hammer. Like, you know those war hammers? I picture that yeah. dude carrying around a big hammer. I picture them calling him the hammer. And I think when that dude walked out, they saw him old standing there with that big hammer and that look on his face, and they said, I'll take the other side. Nobody wanted none of that guy because he was never satisfied <laughs> yeah. because he wanted to do what God said, and he wanted, let, let's, break, let's bring it home. Let's, let's not make it something out in space. You're stuck in your job. You've been in the same job. You're capped out. You can't make any more money. And you're going, well, this is the way it is. That's a rut. Get out of your yeah. freaking job. Get a career. Pray. Get creative. Put no, some and, what happens, in it. and what happens, Rich, if they don't, uh, then, they, then they go off into uh, self-destructive behaviors. They start screwing their secretary. Yep. Uh, they get into uh, gambling. I, I know a guy that's just completely uh, just – he lives in Texas. He's a good dude. He's just bored. You know, he's very wealthy, hates his job, goes down and just gambles his ass off yeah. down in Louisiana in Mississippi. It's like, that sounds like dude, a blues get a, song. Get a fresh vision, man. Rich, we can't stay in ruts and we can't, you know, plod along in life if uh, unless, you know, people have ceased to go to hell. Or, um, you know, Christ has got a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. You can't rest. Well, you well, just what can't a, stop. What about getting in a rut in your marriage? Oh, man, that's why you got to have Freaky Thursday, man. If she wants you, <laughs> listen, if she wants you to dress up like Carl Lagerfeld and get those big glorious Swanson sunglasses on and wear a white powdered wig like George Washington and come in wearing a tux, and uh, then do it. And ladies, I got to tell you uh, the same thing. Go to Victoria's Secrets, go to Fredericks of Hollywood, go to some Halloween costume <laughs> uh, store and rock your husband's world. Mix it up, man. My favorite, get my kooky, favorite thing is get crazy. When oh, and also rich public sex. I mean, not out in the public, but uh, yeah, go go find a don't a get arrested. Or don't get arrested. Yeah. So check this out, Doug. I think it's funny that the you know the devil's always selling stuff that the church is buying, right? And it's like make sure the women. Have their hair up in a bun. Make sure you don't wear any makeup. Make sure you wear some long potato sack, cool. you know. And then the next thing you know, people get surprised that the men are looking at women outside the church. Those hussies. It's like, hey, <laughs> try putting some makeup on that face. You know what I'm saying? That's, I've yeah. said this before. It's like you can always spot the, the Christians out in town. You know, it's like, look, there's Mabel looking ugly for Jesus. You know, put, put some makeup on. Try some deodorant. Brush your fangs. You know, that's, those are good starters. But I'll tell you what, when, when you stop trying to win your spouse, you're, you're headed for a rut. As soon as you get into the everyday whatever, you're headed for a rut. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. You, you have to win each other. You, you have to care. You don't have to say, it's like the old guy that said, the, the, his wife told him they'd been married 60 some years. You know, it's a story, so it doesn't matter the age, they're old. And she says, why don't you ever tell me you love me anymore? He said, well, I told you when I married you, and if it changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> Wrong answer. Right. You're a horrible piece of crap. You know what I mean? Like, bro, I, you got to get bro, it. I went, I went shopping the other day, got some, got some nice threads, looking, you know, looking uh, Very smart. Very dapper. Sharp, solid. And, um, you know, around the house, uh, it's, it's camo shorts that are bespeckled with paint. The T-shirt that I bought back in 1997 at an Army surplus store, because I'm an artist, what I do, and uh, you know I don't I don't have to dress up. So anyway, uh, I I come out of the uh, the master bedroom, cutting through the kitchen, and Mary Mark's like, she goes, oh my gosh, man, she goes, you look so handsome. I go, you say that twice, and I'm not going to make it to my meeting. <laughs> that a baby. You got to keep it alive, man. You got to, it's relationship with God, relationship with your kids, relationship with your family. 
uh, again, you know, looking at the rut our nation is in and how to come in there and, and fix it or entertainment or education. There's there's any any person that's quasi alive and rich semi sensitive to the Holy Spirit. They've got to feel that holy wild hair that's telling them, I want you to sow more. I want you to do more. I want you to pray more earnestly. I want you to get more involved. This whole thing of, well, I'm just an independent Texan, or I'm going to be a hermit for Christ. Uh, that doesn't wash. Nope. It, might, it might work with some person who's an invalid uh, or somebody who's called to intercession. Yep. But if uh, if you got three teeth and an IQ of 50 and a pulse and a heartbeat, God's going to constantly be pushing to you. The unchangeable one's going to be constantly pushing you to do this thing called cha-cha-change. Yep, that's right. And just for the record, Doug, I don't have any guns. I've literally gotten rid of all of my guns. I own no firearms. I'm never going to I'm never going to own again a gun again. Well, just I'm, for a public I'm, record. Just Right. I, I will never I will never change in that direction. Holy Spirit's really going to have to work a number on me to <laughs> I, I I'm never going to have guns again, so nobody can take my guns away cuz I don't have any. Wink, wink, hard wink. Okay, check this out. So when Jesus showed up and they were doing the temple thing, my mind just went back to that. What did Jesus do? He went and messed it up. He went and messed up their temple deal. He's like, hold on a second. There's a dude who needs healing. Let me heal you. How dare God show up and mess up our religion? You know, I I heard this great story about um, a, a black guy who went to a white church down south and he applied for membership and they told him, they said, no, man, you know, we looked at the thing and theologically and we don't really line up, so we don't think you're good for membership. And, and obviously it was racism, right? So the guy leaves and, and he's pretty bummed out and he's hanging out a couple weeks later. He's in a grocery store and he sees one of the guys from the board of that church. And the guy comes up to him and said, hey, man, I'm really sorry you couldn't get in. He goes, oh, it's okay, I'm fine. The guy goes, what do you mean? He said, I prayed and the Lord told me he's been trying to get in that church for years. He can't get in there either. And so (laughs) people get stuck in their messed up mindsets and they get stuck in their ruts and they don't want God to mess up their world. Guess what? God wants to mess with you. God wants to mess with you. He wants you moving. He wants you mobile. Man, a rudder on a ship doesn't do anything on a ship that's not moving. You can turn that steering wheel all you want. God, give me direction. He's like, move, move. If you move, I'll give you some direction. But people want to stay the same. They want to sit in their church. Church is boring. You're boring. Bring somebody, bring a crackhead. Bring your coworker who's a crackhead. I don't care. Bring somebody. Be there when somebody you care about gets saved. It's not boring anymore. God showed up. Hey, uh, um, speaking about uh, uh, you know jostling the apple cart, uh, there was this guy that I used to uh, do a lot of. Actually, uh, he was my buddy's little brother, and um, uh, me and my buddy back in the high in high school, a lot of weed, a lot of cocaine, a lot of acid. And um, we we all took LSD one night, and uh, same same acid, same tab. We had you know one window pane. We cut it in quarters. Had four guys that were dropping acid that night. We each took a, a little chip, put it on the tongue, let the lysergic acid dilithamide absorb into our system. And then we start seeing candy canes and unicorns. Well, his little brother who took the acid, he didn't see candy canes and unicorns, and it wasn't a happy trip. I don't know if you ever did uh, LSD, Rich, but Negative. you can't get off of it. You can't get off of it. It's not like, you know, you, you know, you drink too much, take a nap, drink some coffee, you know, get back at it again. <laughs> uh, uh, the synthetic hallucinogen LSD, that's a 10 to 12 hour trip. Whoa, I didn't know that. So, yeah, it's uh, like like psilocybin mushrooms. The ones that I did, five to six hours, you know, and uh, LSD, though, the, the synthetic stuff, 10 to 12 hours Whoa. on just a little tiny tab, man. So anyway, uh, it, it basically brings out, you know, uh, and exaggerates your background or whatever mood you're in. So this guy uh, definitely had some, you know, some rough and horrible dealings with his parents. I mean, he was a mess. He took acid and he went nuts. And, uh, and I don't, you know, the last time I saw him, we brought him to church. Mary Margaret and I are driving down the road. This is before we were in ministry and stuff. We're at a big church, a uh, 9,000 member uh, congregation, huge auditorium, had this massive skylight ridge at the top of the church. So <clears throat> pastor was cool. Pastor used to be a drug dealer. Uh, he used to uh, take drugs as well. So he wasn't a fastidious Pharisee. 
And so everybody's like, you know, we got to reach the lost, Richard. We just got to reach out. We got to love the unlovely. Those who are least and last and lost, we have to love them. And so Mary Margaret and I are driving down the road in uh, West Texas during December. And brother, it's it's colder than a witch's boob in a brass bra. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> He's walking down the road, man. He's in short shorts. Do you remember the stone washed? Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Jeans. He's got a he's got a pair of Daisy Dukes on. He's got the whitest legs I've ever seen to uh, uh, known to mankind. Black hairs all over him. So I mean, it's not. A, <laughs> I'm not a gay man, but if I was, he wouldn't be a looker. He's he's uh, he doesn't have a shirt on. He's got one of those goose down coats, you know, the ones that are all puffy and stuff. Yeah. He's got the sleeves pushed up to his elbows, and he's got his head shaved. And I'm driving down the road. It's like, who is that nut? And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's so-and-so. Slam on the brakes. It's like, hey, man, what are you doing? He goes, hey, brother, you know, got any weed or what's going on? Who's this hot chick in your car? Blah, blah, blah. I go, hey, I'm a Christian now. You know, gave my life to Christ. You want to come to church? He goes, sure. I go, okay, we're going to pick you up at five. Church service is six. So we, we bring him to church. Sun's still kind of out. So from the skylight, you got a little bit of light cascading down into the auditorium. Uh, Mary Margaret and I always sat on the front row. Uh, we bring Alan. He hasn't changed. He's not in like a suit and tie, you know, blue jacket, red tie, khaki pants, the total evangelical wardrobe. Uh, he's, he's wearing the same uh, attire. He sits on the front row, man, lights up a cigarette. <laughs> and this is a huge auditorium, Rich. It's a huge auditorium. And that smoke cloud just starts wafting up to the skylight. It looked like, you know, the tabernacle of Moses with the incense yeah, rising yeah. up. Brother, every freaking Pharisee in that place came alive. The pastor, he didn't do anything. He just keeps, uh, he keeps you know, delivering his message. Mary Margaret and I kind of look at each other. It's like, well, we're, we're about to find out. We're bringing the loss. That's what you said. <laughs> we're about to find out who the legalists are. Afterwards, uh, they came and uh, they surrounded him, tried to cast the devil out of him. And he just looked at him, you know, like they're a piece of crap. And um, uh, our pastor walks up to him and says, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. That busted the rut. You say, oh, we're just after the loss. You really get some lost people. Who don't follow your stupid rules, you're going to see real quick if you're in uh, what Rich read about the rot in the rut of a church. Yep. Because they will they will jack your apple cart, man. Yep, that's and, right. You uh, can't say Christianity's. You, you can't say you want to reach the lost, then get mad when they show up. You know what I'm saying? Like that. <laughs> when we first started our church, it's when the really really low jeans, the lower the girls could wear jeans, the better they were. You know, and muffin uh, tops. No, not our church. We had a pretty young church. There were no muffin tops. That wasn't the problem. The problem was the butt cleavage. People's butts were hanging out. When they sat down, literally half their butts were out. And so, you know, we were a new church. We didn't have any money, and we had those metal folding chairs. You know, you get get what you got and go with what you got. And one guy <laughs> right. was standing there worshiping, and some really hot young girl was standing in front of him, and, and her butt's hanging out. And his wife, the, the guy's wife, take, re leans over with a jacket and puts it over the back of her chair. So that when she sits down, her butt's not hanging out, right? She didn't say anything. That's I actually thought that was a great move, right? That's good. And so people started talking to me, Doug. To me, they started talking to me saying, well, maybe we should institute a dress code. And I was like, are yeah, that's you a good people idea. out of your freaking <laughs> minds, right? And this, and you, so you know what we did, Doug? We maybe, took, maybe we should also have a, a, a side room where we can check to see whether they're circumcised or not. Right. You know, yeah, it would become Jews, right? So here's the deal. So what we did is... I said, that's it. We took up an offering and we spent 45000 Now, that might not sound a lot of, like a lot of money to a lot of people. To our church, it was all of our money and then some. And then everybody was to buy chairs that went all the way down in the back and we called them crack blockers. And but but yes. we didn't cast the vision like that, but we said we're going to get some new chairs and we let the leaders know, look, man, that's the style. That's how people, they're not trying to be rude. They're not trying to be disrespectful. Right. They're trying to come to church. So I'm not going to make a rule that they can't come dressed like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to provide chairs that keep them covered, right? And so that ended up being just fine, you know? And then people, you know, they learn that church is not the place to dress, you know, like you're going to the club on Friday night or something. They learn that as they come to be respectful right. and stuff. But look, man, you don't clean the fish before you get them in the boat. That don't even make any sense. 
You know, we're casting the net. And what's the Bible say? You get the net. There's all kinds of things in the net. Bring them in and don't start complaining. You can't pray, God answer my prayer. And when God answers your prayer, complain that God answered your prayer. Because either you want it or you don't want it. You know, I'm, everybody wants to get, you know, the rich couple from Scottsdale who comes and starts writing million dollar checks, you know. Hell and then yeah. they want to act like they're all spiritual. But they don't want to get the guy that's walking down the street, you know, that lost his job and doesn't have a place to stay that you're going to have to help. And so we got to get out of this. You want to get out of a rut? Start following Jesus. Do what Jesus did. You yeah. want to get out of a rut? Start following. Get off the temple. Start getting on the tabernacle, man. Let's talk about uh, uh, quickly uh, before we wrap it. Um, I got I got eight bullet points I'm gonna Throw throw at there. you and and um and you comment on it. Uh, first of all, I would I would assume that that um, we're probably all in a rut in some way would, in some area no, of our I mean, life. Yeah, absolutely. If you're human. If, uh, if, if you came, you know, from a human body and you're beset with sin, you're probably in a rut or the powers of darkness are trying to lull you into that place of being at ease in Zion where you don't need anything and you're rich and secure and you don't realize that you're wretched and vomitous. But, uh, number one, uh, you got to realize, uh, that God didn't bring you into this kingdom so that you could be boring. That's okay? right. He didn't. Abundant life, folks. Acts wasn't boring. The conquest of Canaan, not boring. No. Rich? It's not boring if you're serving God. If you are not serving God, it's boring. If your life is boring, you're in a rut. And, and you got me totally tripping on a whole other thing. If we're not in a rut, because you said we're all in a rut, and I thought, well, I'm not in a rut. You want to know why? Because I just kicked my way out of one. <laughs> so I thought we're either kicking our way out of a rut. We're in a rut, kicking our way out of a rut, or once we got out, we're starting to dig another rut. And so yeah. you, you can't launch my brain in one direction and then jerk me back the other way because I was totally on that last thought that you said. It's too, All right, number it's two. too fast for me, man. How to get out of the rut. Uh, again, number one, uh, realize God didn't call you to nope. be comfortable. He called you to be an earth shaker. He didn't call number you two. to be comfortable. He called you to be courageous and to be a conqueror, number two. Yep. Uh, <laughs> number two, uh, shake yourself, man. I mean, Isaiah said, uh, you, you, those who are at ease, shake yourself, loose yourself, as T.D. Jakes would say, from your change, man. Pray like the third monkey trying to get on <laughs> Noah's ark. You, here's what I would do uh, in regards to shaking yourself. Repent more. Don't hey, sin. Hey, Don't hey. sin. And just like, eh, that wasn't a big deal. I'm under grace. Uh, well, that sin also crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, it can grieve away the Holy Spirit, yep. according to um, who's that guy? Oh, Paul. Uh, yeah. So, so pray more earnestly uh, for whatever. Don't let you know. If you see these things happen, it's like, well, that's that's a shame. No, it's not a shame. You've been given an arsenal, the weapons of warfare. You've been given holy forty-four magnums that you can level at the devil. Then do it. Repent more. Yeah. Uh, really sing good. louder. Serve more. Uh, be open to get sent. When get you hear bigger. Isaiah six, when you when you hear Isaiah six six, Lord, uh, or the Lord says, "Who shall I send?" It's just like, eh, not me, man. I'm comfortable. No, say so send me. You know what I like send about me. that verse? Do it up. The Lord Isaiah gets let in on the conversation between the Godhead. Who who are we going to send? I don't know. Do we have anybody? They're having this conversation in front of the in the presence of the premier prophet of the land which a prophet's job is to take God's word to God's people. And God's saying, hey, do you think we could find anybody to be a prophet? Like, is there anybody? And then Isaiah's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've been in a rut. I'm sorry. I just got my face lit on fire. I'm out of the rut, man. Can you? And you know what? People call it the commissioning of Isaiah. I believe that's theologically, biblically incorrect. I believe that's the recommissioning of a prophet. I believe yeah. that changes whole entire life. So I believe, I'm with you, Doug. Get in there in the presence of God. Say, I'm, I'm here. Send me. I'm open. Send me again. Send me again. Yeah. I'm open. You know? All right. What if, what if, uh, what if, uh, you got a rich, particular lady listening to the podcast right now. Rich, she's got um, she's got her gynecologist. She has her spa. She has you know her girlfriends. Are you open to uh, God saying, "Listen, I'm going to ship you to Mumbai," or or or, or we're going to go? Not not that he's always going to do the the weird aberration, but what if he wants to liquidate you know all these things that have made you comfortable, and yet so. 
I don't know, Rich. Boring. What if he's what what if he's got another dice roll in your life for his glory and his kingdom? Yeah. Man, I, again, Rich, I got to tell you, at fifty six, I'm think you know I was thinking I'm landing this plane, and God's like bullshit. Pull back on that throttle and yep. tilt that nose up in the air. We're going, he's like we're going we're going again, baby. Follow the flame, son. We're moving out. Number three, every everything can get into the rut, and again. Realize it. Warriors and wild men, get into the rut. Number five, uh, here's here's a point, Rich, that I know you're going to jump on like stink on a monkey. To get out of a rut, get around righteously provocative people. Yep. Yep. You know, people, I, I've said this before, that people a lot of times are like water. That Water always tries to find its level because there's no pressure. When you see water going over a waterfall, that's pressure. When you're around people that are at a lower level than you, maybe spiritually, financially, whatever that deal is, it requires something of you. Paul said, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. It, it costs you something, right, to give. That's why people try to peer up all the time. But to go to another level, to be around leaders of a higher level, for water to go to a higher level has to be under pressure. And so people avoid the pressure and they avoid the pouring out because we want to peer up. If you want to kick yourself out of that rut, then you need to start getting around some people to give what you got, and then you need to get around some leaders be under that pressure to go up to another level. You can break out of that rut, and you can be provoked to righteousness, man. You can do some things. Yeah, and, and I believe the injunction in Hebrews is to provoke one another to love and to good deeds. And, uh, and, <laughs> and that sounds like a, an expulsion from this thing called the open-ended grave, the rut, man. And uh, I, you know what, you know what I dig. You know, as, as an older cat who's set in his ways, like ah, I don't need this and I don't need <laughs> that. And, ah! I like getting around young people, man. And and you just you see how uh, abreast they are on technology, on culture, on expansion. And uh, we are dealing. You know, uh, I mean, we see it with wars and wild men. I mean. Frickin' half the listeners are in the Philippines. Yeah, you know. Yeah, this thing's all this thing's all over the planet, and uh, I I like the, I like the energy of young people. I like how it provokes me to stay more attuned to what's going on, and and again I like uh you know if I can't find provocative friends I will read and watch and listen to provocative stuff. Yeah, because I know my proclivity, man, is always to settle down in the rut. So. Get around that which provokes you. Yeah, man, good that, man. That That's just good. Make just jacks with you. It won't leave you alone. Uh, also, just because you're not uh, Miley virus doesn't mean you're not, or doesn't mean you're okay. You need to realize that. Well, Paul said, if you compare yourself with other people, then you're without wisdom. Yeah, you do foolishly. Another version says you do wickedly. Wow, wickedly. Yeah, when you yeah, compare so again, yourselves one to another, so that's not the goal, right? That's what you're saying. Yes, that's wicked. It's uh, so it's it's again, it's it's self congratulatory. It's like, well, I'm not that whore over there. I'm not that poor drunk over there. And God's like, okay, hey, what they are, or or I'm not like um, you know, John. And uh, Jesus said to Peter, it's none of none your, of your business, business. That's right. what he does. I'm here, hello, mm -hmm. and I'm jacking with you. So just because you're not Miley Virus or somebody else doesn't mean that you're okay. Right. Uh, number seven, realize uh, Christianity uh, always entails change. Mm. Fresh oil mm. from suckiness rich to significance. Mm. Jesus bringing new wine, new song. You know what? The That's other day, it. man. I'm I was, giving an offering so, right now. I'm getting some money out. <laughs> that was good. Here it is. This is an hey, offering. Hey, Rich. I was, I was watching um, a great conference. Uh, just the the, the message freaking blew my mind, man. Put put a uh, put some nitrous oxide in my uh, my injectors. I know that sounds weird, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it it lit me up. The thing that disturbed me is that they're singing the same songs that everybody else is singing. It's all Hillsong songs, and everybody's singing Hillsong songs. And like we talked about after the Wars and Wildmen conference. Like we need to spawn our own music. We need to sing a new song, and um, that—that's what brings again that change, that fresh oil, uh, the stuff that jacks with you being in your current local boring condition. Yep. And um, you know, songwriters that are out there, book writers that are out there, artists that are out there, 
they they know that they are constantly, if they're going to be relevant, they've got to keep coming up with new stuff. Just yep. like in the movie that we we're talking about before the podcast, Rich, the uh, Star Wars Born. What did Bradley Cooper's character tell Lady Gaga when he found her in that uh, that transsexual bar after he heard her sing that amazing French song? What, what did he ask her? I don't remember. I love that movie, though. He said, uh, do you write your own stuff? Oh, yeah, that's right. And she said that she didn't want to sing it. She didn't sing her own songs. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was awesome. Because you can and, repeat and, what uh, other people are doing. And there's nothing wrong with doing what other people are doing, but there's got to be something in cr- creative inside of you, man. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, again, if you're creative, though, that's a rut. That's a rut. Rich, Rich can you imagine if you and I freaking knew how to sing and play guitar? First of all, I'd probably never gotten saved. I'd been like, you know... Uh, bon Jovi or or freaking Godsmack or something like that, and I'd be on uh, Bon Scott's Highway to Hell <laughs> right now. But say that I I I could sing, say that I could uh, play an instrument, and I could slay it. It would kill me to sing somebody else's song because you're foregoing your pain, you're foregoing uh, foregoing your victory, you're foregoing uh, all the stuff that God's done in you. And yeah, it takes some work, but oh my God, man, when, when that thing emanates from the, the broken vessel that's been blessed and healed and anointed by God, that thing, again, will leave memory burn. And just because, and there's, I don't believe, Rich, for a second that there's only a few people in Hillsong and Bethel that are able to craft songs for the body of Christ. That's I right. believe every local congregation, everybody who's a psalmist, Man, dig deep. David wasn't like, I wonder what you two's doing. Let me see if I can copy it. He freaking did his own stuff and sang it to sheep. Yep. And the Holy Spirit preserved those musings for uh, for all of mankind. Well, I was, so ta- I was deep, talking man. to Jeff Dio, and he's a multiple Dove Award winner. And uh, he was the lead singer for Sonic Flood, written a lot of great worship songs. And and you know what he said? I thought this was great for, for the guys that, that can write songs and stuff. He said, you just have to say the things that have been said in a way that people haven't said it before. That, that's, that's what worship is, because why is it? It's not, it's not like, look, man, we're worshiping Jesus. He doesn't change, but we can get in a rut by saying the same thing. So what we yeah, need to Romans, do is we, we most, just, most worship songs are Romans 8, 28, yep. you know, ad nauseum, ad infinitum. Yeah, at some point, you have to step back, and, and fresh worship is to say, I love you, Lord, in a way that that's different than I said it yesterday. I got to think, look, if you just tell your wife, you send her the same, you know, the same words every day and say, I love you. You're beautiful. Look, at some point that doesn't mean anything. That's, that's what explaining to your wife that you love her in a growing relationship is, is thinking of a, another way to tell her what she means to you. That's worship right there. It's Jesus doesn't change. We're saying the same thing, but man, we got to think of a way that, that, that this is how I feel inside and, and sing it in a way that a generation wants to express to God the immutable, the forever truths that never change. Yeah, or say that um, uh, you're running out of ideas, you know, you, you're not a deep well, nothing's coming to you. Take the Psalms that are forever preserved that God gave the big thumbs up to and sing that. When's the last time you heard Psalm 1? Yep. Blessed is the man who doesn't stand in the counsel yep. of the wicked, nor sit sit the seat of the scoffer. His well, delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates upon that day and night. His leaf not going to wither. Something incredible. Whatever he does is going to prosper. Something incredible that I've seen this generation is they love the hymns because they didn't grow up in church and get tired of the hymns. So the hymns are new again. So right. people are updating the hymns, adding a bridge changing the music up a little bit and yep. and young this young generation Doug blows up over hymns because that was not their rut man that's yeah. a new way of saying it and and they're loving it and I like that because obviously hymns were written to combat the heresy of the day and teach theology to the church so as a pastor I'm like sing that theology kids <laughs> yeah and plus it uh most most of the the solid uh historic great hymns they weren't defeatist either that's right it wasn't like oh Jesus Please rescue me. If there'd been a 25th hour in the day, I would have never made it. It's like a mighty fortress is mm-hmm. our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortals, ills prevailing. Like goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. But uh, God provideth still. Well, His word is never failing. 
And, and the, the greatest hymn of all times, Amazing Grace, you know, I mean, the, 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 but even that song that saved a wretch like me and everybody, you know, we love that song because we identify it. That song doesn't end on that. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining like the sun, we've no less days to sing your praise than when we've first begun. And so we're talking about this is where I came from. This is where I'm at now, and look where we're going. So, I mean, it does recognize our condition, but it also recognizes that Jesus was, the, was our savior, is our Savior from that condition, and we're going somewhere else. We're not staying like this. I'm not here to have a good cry, man. Yeah, and I, I also love how it's so uh, counterintuitive, uh, or, or counters, rather, uh, this, this therapeutic community. It's like, well, you're okay. You know, no. He said he's a wretch. You ever— <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Have you looked wretch up in the dictionary, hey, young millennial? That's identifying your condition. You remember the old saying, Doug, I'm okay, you're okay? I remember yep. an old, a great Christian t-shirt that said, I'm okay, you're okay. And on the back, it has Jesus crucified with blood everywhere. It says, then explain this. You know what? I'm not okay. You're not okay. Jesus is okay. Under his blood, we're going to make it. But we need to recognize who we are and who he is. That's worship. You want to get creative? Let's worship like that. Hey, uh, last one, um, and this this is something that terrifies me, man. And and I'm I'm in this terror zone right now, Rich. And and I'm not I'm not ashamed to to confess it. You should and I should fear never changing. Oh, there there should there should there should be something so significant happening in our lives on a regular basis that your wife and family says, "Whoa, man, that that ain't Rich. That ain't Doug." That's God, because Doug and Rich do X, Y, and Z. They ain't doing it anymore. Yep. Fear never changing, fear never producing fruit. And, uh, you know, God's got a lot of ways where he can uh, curse people, but he doesn't really have to kill you. He just has to turn your vision off. He just has to remove, you know, that heat and that conviction. And you think you're fine and you're dandy, I'm not saying that you're going to go to hell. Uh, if you're born again, you're born again, but there's going to be a lot of people that are ashamed of what they could have done yep. if they would have really, like Tozer said, if he would have really accessed the grace of God in his life. But I, you know, to get out of the rut, I would, I would fear staying the same. Yeah. I would fear never changing. hundred percent. hundred. We should, we should fear getting in that rut and getting stuck that way, man. I, here, here's, here's my last thought on this, Doug, and, and you can. You can roll and do what you do. Uh, in First Chronicles, there's a story, and it's talking about David fighting the Philistines, and he had he had conquered, he had beat them in the last battle, and and a lot of times in the Old Testament, and I know you know this, a lot of people may not know this, but to beat someone in the war, you had to beat them five to seven battles. It wasn't just one battle and it was over. Sometimes they came back the next season, the next season. Once you conquered them five to seven times, usually the battle had been, has won. The war is won, right? And that's why they say you might, you might win the battle and lose the war. So these guys, they had to do it again and again. And this is interesting because this shows David's heart for God. In First Chronicles 14, it says, but after a while, the Philistines re- returned and raided the valley again. And so David had just come, the last season they had conquered them, right? And once again, it says again, Doug, I like this. David asked God, what to do. Well, how can a general, okay, we're not talking about King David. We're talking about General David, right? He's a general right now. I conquered, Not a teenager. Yeah, I conquered. Yeah, and I, I'm a warrior. We're talking about warrior David, right? I conquered them the last time they came down into the valley. All right. They come again. Well, obviously, you have to defend yourself. You have to go to war with them. But David says, he asked God what to do. He doesn't say, all right, I'm going to go do what we did last time. I know how to do this. He asked God, listen to this. And the Lord says, do not attack them straight on. Instead, circle around behind and attack attack them near the poplar trees. When you hear a sound like marching feet in the tops of the poplar trees, go out and attack. That will be the signal that God is moving ahead of you to strike down the Philistine army. Doug, this story to me blows my mind, and this is why. You're talking about an expert general who could easily do what he knows how to do, but he's not like that. He's not. And pretty, in, mu- and pretty much knows God's mind. Yeah. And he's got the word. He's got the word That's of God, right. you know, go wipe out the enemy. Right. But what? But he's a guy who's not in a rut at this point in his life, Doug. And he's like, God, what should I do? Don't attack him like you did last time. Okay. 
go around the side. When you come around the side and you hear the rustling, like the sound of marching of feet, come on, that's spiritual right there, right? The, the angels of heaven are on their way, but we know that wind almost always signifies the presence of the Holy Spirit. Instead of doing what you know how to do, trust in me, listen to the Holy Spirit, do it the way I'm gonna show you, I'll go ahead of you and you'll conquer them worse this time than you did last time. And, and I think in our life, that's where we need to be and stop thinking we know how to do everything and start asking God, what should I do? And when he tells us what to do, how should I do it? And then also waiting on the Lord and following the Lord into what he's called us to do. And I think that's a good way to stay on the edge of what God's doing and not to get stuck in a rut of, well, this is what I do. I've done it a hundred times. I'm gonna do it 101. And I think that's a great mindset. So that's my last thought on that. Thanks for for firing that all up in my mind and, and making me no, think about beautiful. those things and teaching me these things on this podcast. Cause I I'm pumped about it. I mean, you look at David must've been in his fifties at that juncture. Yep. Again, again, he's written, you know, holy inspired, uh, Psalms. He knows, uh, what the law and the prophet prophets have to say. And he's still not presuming nope. on his relationship with God, man. That's awesome stuff. Yeah. That's that's getting out of your rut right there, folks. Yeah, man. Let's and kick again, the end you know, out. He, he, and he had a biblical rut he could have followed. He had a success formula. And God's like, uh, well, thanks for asking. Here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome, brother. Hey, uh, Rich, uh, that's a wrap on how to get out of your rut, ladies and germs. Uh, what does the Warrior and Wild Men subscriber need to do? Go to warriorsandwildmen.com. Sign up. Give us your email. We'll send you some cool stuff. Um, go to our podcast. Subscribe, rate it, review it, share it with some friends. Send us some friends. Say, hey, listen to this, man. This will help you out. And uh, together we can make some things happen. Look, me and Doug can talk to each other all day. That doesn't help anybody. If we're helping you and you think it'll help someone else, you're helping them. We're joined together as a team. And that's the Warriors and Wild Men Tribe.